Uh, hello everyone. Uh, we have Mr. Dipanjan Sarkar and Mr. Syed Paul. Uh, they are both Google developer experts and the workshop will be starting in the next five minutes. So if any one of you is yet to join, if any of your friends are yet to join, do let them know that uh, the workshop will be starting at 2 5 p.m. sharp. And if any of and if any of you are facing any issues, you may please drop your queries in the chat section. We'll be there to help you out. Okay. Uh, Sanket, are we recording this session? Uh, yeah, this will be recorded. Yes, sir. Okay, okay. That's 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 actually very good. So uh, I'll probably reach out to you after this is done uh, to get the recording if that's possible. Uh, yeah, surely, sure. We'll we'll also make it available to the participants if they are facing any internet issues, then they can just watch it later on also. Oh, cool. Thank you. Uh, so it's 2 5 p.m. already. Uh, do start the session. I'll be going off stage for now. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I think we'll get started. Uh, so, Sayak, I hope you can hear me. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. That's great. Uh, one second. Let me 
Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, good afternoon from uh, wherever you are dialing in. And today we will be covering an interesting session on adversarial robustness in deep learning. So we will be looking at some uh, hands-on aspects also in terms of how can you attack deep learning models and how can you fool them into thinking something is something else. So that is basically the whole point of the session. And also we will talk about how you can combat some of these uh, intrusive attacks. And this is a new area of uh, deep learning. So definitely recommend you to uh, go through the complete session recording also later on for those of you who are not able to join in. And we will also be sharing the uh, code resources so that you don't need to like uh, copy all the code or take screenshots because uh, everything will be available. Uh, later on because we have open source this on github. So I will be sharing my screen. Is the presentation visible? Yes, this is visible. Oh. Wonderful. So just give me a second. Okay, so we will be uh, sharing our resources uh, online on GitHub. So feel free to uh, go to this link uh, and save this link. We will probably flash this at the end of the session also once. Uh, for those of you who are dialing in, you can just take a note of it. So I will uh, paste this in the chat also. Okay, so now I will uh, mention to all of you that uh, you don't need to like copy all the code and all that because it's already there. So you can focus more on understanding the concepts as well as the methodologies which we will be talking about today for adversarial robustness in deep learning. In terms of the overall se session agenda, these are some of the main aspects we will be talking about uh, in terms of uh, understanding some of the essentials of deep learning just to set the stage so that everyone is on a level playing field. In case someone doesn't know about deep learning, you can get the general idea in the deep learning essential section. Then we will focus on the meat of the session, which is understanding different techniques in which you can attack these deep learning models. Today, we will be focusing more in the context of computer vision. So applications like image classification and so on, that is what we will be focusing on. So how can you fool these classification models, which are based off deep learning architectures like convolution neural networks. So we will look at a wide variety of adversarial attack methodologies. And we will also uh, show you how you can perform these types of attacks using TensorFlow, which is a popular deep learning library. And then we will also talk about adversarial learning, which is all about uh, understanding how these attacks are happening, as well as figuring out ways in which you can combat these attacks so that your models end up being more robust. And that's the whole point of adversarial robustness, where you are trying to train your deep learning based uh, convolution neural network models to be more robust to these kind of attacks so that in the future, if someone tries to attack this model, it will be able to at least resist this attack versus taking a plain uh, deep learning CNN model, let's say which you have trained without adversarial learning. So that will be the whole point of the last part of the session. Given that we have a lot of content to cover, we'll probably try to cover all the major sections and then we'll take Q&A at the end of the session. In case we take a break in between, given that we have enough time, we'll take Q&A then also, but otherwise we'll plan to cover everything so that uh, you don't miss out on any of the content. In terms of ourselves, I think, so basically uh, I'm a data science lead working on a wide variety of problems on machine learning, deep learning, natural language processing, and computer vision. I've also published several books on uh, the same area, as well as I uh, share content in the form of uh, sessions, webinars, uh, conferences, as and when I get time. And besides that, as I've already been introduced, I'm also a Google developer expert in machine learning. I'll go ahead and let Saik introduce himself before we jump into the session. Yeah, uh, thanks, Dipanjan. So my name is Sayuk. Uh, I'm a deep learning associate at PyMet Search for King. Uh, on problems pertaining to computer vision. I mainly work at the intersection of deep learning and computer vision. And of the work, I like to contribute to open source initiatives like TensorFlow and TensorFlow Hub. And I like to speak at conferences uh, like this and work on uh, technical ideas on my weekends. And besides that, I'm an avid Netflix fan and currently I'm binging Better Call Saul. So that's it. And I'll let Dipanjan take it. Wonderful. So in terms of um, 
deep learning essentials uh, we will be just focusing on some of the main concepts as well as some of the main aspects of deep learning which you need to know so that you can understand about adversarial learning for uh, deep learning models so in terms of deep learning the focus for today won't be on each and every part of deep learning because that is a field on its own but the focus will be more on how we will be using deep learning in our session which is focusing more on visual data in the context of computer vision so in computer vision the type of deep learning architectures which are used widely are known as convolution neural networks also popularly known as cnns and cnns typically have a stack layered architecture as some of you might already be knowing about this where it has multiple convolution and pooling layers as you can see here and this is an example of a convolution neural network which was trained to recognize handwritten digits so that let's say you gave a scanned image of this five it would go through this model let's say which has been already trained on similar label data so that it could predict that okay this is the digit five so that's the whole point of it trying to be able to process uh, visual information in the form of images and then being able to uh, predict some kind of an outcome in this case it's a class because it's a classification problem and the way it does this is it uses a bunch of convolution and pooling layers as you can see so it's a stacked architecture where it has multiple convolution and pooling layers the main focus of this deep learning model is instead of using traditional computer vision or image processing methods which we used to let's say do uh, several years back in the form of trying to extract edges manually patterns manually different types of transforms uh, from the image manually and extract numeric features and then feed it into some kind of a machine learning model instead of spending a lot of time on hand crafted features which take a lot of time to generate the idea is can you let the model learn those features themselves from the data and that is where the secret source of these convolution neural networks is the convolution layer which consists of a wide variety of filters also known as kernels and the whole point or the whole uh, aspect of these filters is to slide through the input image and extract the right kind of features which help the model in recognizing the type of image it is based on the label so that is where in the convolution layer we usually have some filters or kernels the concept of filter or kernel is not new so if you look this up later this is this has been there since traditional image processing days where we have a wide variety of kernels which is basically a matrix of numbers and what used to happen is we used to multiply that by sliding it through the input image and it used to enhance certain parts of the image like an edge or a corner or a circle and so on and the whole point was once we get that output which is known as a feature map we used to pass it to a downstream application like classification and so on so the same thing is happening here where instead of using just one filter or manually trying to figure out the filters the model itself adapts the filters based on the data it is receiving and how it does that is it uses the principle of back propagation to update the weights of the filters also so that it can extract the right kind of features from the images to do efficient classification and the way the convolution layer works is each of these filters which is like a matrix of numbers it is passed over the entire image in patches and it computes uh, basically a matrix multiplication and it does a sum and the result is summed up into one number or you can say one feature map pixel per operation and the whole point of the convolution layer is to slide that uh, filter across the image and this operation is known as a convolution operation and it does that multiple times to extract different types of features from the image now the next part to remember is that uh, when you do these convolution operations they are expensive and let's say if your image is having a large size and you try to do this one after the other the model training will take a lot of time plus the number of parameters of the model will also increase rapidly and as you may know from the principles of machine learning that if you end up having a large number of parameters or features for that matter in your uh, model on which it's being trained it can tend to overfit plus the computation time will also rise rapidly so that is where we usually have pooling layers after convolution layers and the main purpose of these pooling layers is to downsample the feature maps which are extracted as output from the convolution layers and the way to do this kind of downsampling is to use some kind of an aggregation operation like max pooling 
or you can do average pooling or some pooling where in case of max pooling the type of downsampling which happens is we end up selecting the max pixel value out of a patch of pixels so let's say if we look at four pixels uh, across the image every four pixels we will take the maximum value of that pixel and the feature map size will get reduced so these are the two main layers which are as you can see repeated or stacked multiple times across the architecture and uh, besides this, another thing to remember is that right now all these operations you saw are basic uh, linear algebra operations, but the key in uh, neural networks is nonlinearity. So that is where we have usually activation layers present after convolution layers where the feature maps which come out are usually sent through nonlinear activations. A uh, standard nonlinear activation function is uh, sigmoid as you may have heard of this in case of like logistic regression. In case of these feature maps, usually we will pass it through a popular function known as ReLU, that's rectified linear unit. But again, there are a wide variety and variants of activation functions which you can experiment with. And the whole point is to introduce the nonlinearity. And this whole model is trained via backpropagation where the input images are passed, the features are extracted, it goes to the downstream model, and we finally make a prediction based on some kind of uh, logics which are transformed into probabilities we compare it with the actual label of the image we find out what is the loss we compute the gradients of the loss and then that is back propagated so that's the whole point of back propagation that the weights and these parameters of all these layers will continuously get updated as the model gets trained and in that way, basically what will happen is this model will try to adapt and learn to the data which you're feeding in and the corresponding label so that in the future, if you give an image, it will try to predict one of the classes on which it was trained. Now, another aspect which we will be briefly covering today is the concept of transfer learning, which a lot of you might be knowing about if you have used deep learning models. So traditional machine learning or deep learning is typically performed in isolation where let's say we are solving any problem. We will usually start with formulating the problem, getting the data set, training a model from scratch on that data set or training multiple models on that data set and then picking the best model based on some kind of a performance metric like accuracy, precision, recall and so on. Now let's say we have a new problem coming in after a week. What we'll do is we will again repeat the same process. So no knowledge from the previous uh, problem or no knowledge from the previous models which are trained are shared in the new problem. We again train a model from scratch or we again train multiple models from scratch and repeat the process. So now there is this uh, new paradigm called transfer learning where the idea is if you have performed a task and if you have built, let's say your best model. Now, if you're solving a similar problem, like let's say you built a model to uh, detect pneumonia from x-ray scans now tomorrow you are trying to build a model to detect uh, diabetes from eye retina scans instead of training a deep learning model from scratch on those uh, retina scan data set can you take that previous model and can you extract some of the learned knowledge from that model and reuse it in the new problem so that is where the knowledge from the previous model is shared in the new task when you are building a model instead of uh, training a model from complete scratch and the reason for doing this is uh, usually if your problems are in a similar domain or even if it's not so similar some of the tasks will be very repetitive in nature as you remember we discussed about the convolution and the pooling so that is going to happen in the networks regardless of your problem it is going to try to extract the right kind of features and it is trying to enhance and downsample those extracted features. That's the job of the convolution and pooling layers. And the same thing is going to happen even when we are trying to predict cancer versus pneumonia. So the whole point is, if we already have a deep learning model with uh, all these layers, and a lot of these layers have already learned the weights by backpropagation of the most effective way to extract features, why not take those weights, why not take those layers and use those already pre-trained layers with the pre-trained weights and then you can add in your own layers for classification based on the number of classes you're trying to predict and the other thing you can do is you can take these pre-trained weights from the first uh, problem and then you can fine-tune them by changing the weights gradually as you try to make the new model adapt to your data set 
So the whole point is in neural networks, usually the weights of each and every neuron in each and every layer is initialized randomly using some kind of a distribution and then they slowly get updated with back propagation. So instead of again randomly initializing, initialize it with the pre-trained weight so that maybe you can reach convergence faster and maybe get a better performing model. So that's the whole point of transfer learning where use the knowledge from the prior models which have already been trained, let's say on a large amount of data and then you can use it on a new problem. And that's the whole point of this, leverage a pre-trained deep learning model which is typically trained on let's say a large amount of data. So it has learned a wide variation of ways in which it could extract features from diverse images and then adapt that pre-trained model by transferring its knowledge in the context of our problem. And usually there are two approaches to this. One is you use that pre-trained model as it is. You don't change the weights of those layers. So it will just be used then as a way to extract features. And the other one is you enable the layer weights to get changed based on the data which you're feeding in. That is called fine tuning the pre-trained model so that the model which you're taking from the first problem, it slowly starts training and adapting to your own data set. And the hope is that you can usually reach convergence faster than training with randomly initialized weights because uh, the weights which you are using, the pre-trained weights which you are using are from layers which have been proven to extract features uh, effectively from the first uh, problem which we were talking about. So that is where the whole uh, aspect of the power of transfer learning has been proven across diverse use cases in the industry where nowadays you will see a wide variety of pre-trained models being built by researchers, being built by companies. And if you are working in the industry, often you can reuse some of these models and get a better performance in your own problems rather than training a model from complete scratch. And these are some architectures which you will come across if you read about transfer learning or if you already know about transfer learning. So that is where one of the most popular models is a residual network popularly known as ResNet 50. There are deeper or larger models also like ResNet 152 and so on, which have even more layers. And uh, typically, as you can see, these will be, uh, these, these will consist of blocks of convolutions, pooling, and in some cases, regularization like batch normalization. And the novelty in ResNet was that it introduced something called a residual connection so that features which were learned in the earlier parts of the network, they can also be propagated to the later parts of the network using alternate pathways. And similarly, when the reverse happens, that is when you compute the loss, find out the error, and now you need to update the weights of all these layers, the gradients which will be back propagated, they don't end up being diminished uh, towards the beginning of the network. That's basically known as the vanishing gradient problem. Some of you might be knowing about it. So to prevent things like this, uh, researchers started coming up with new innovative ways to build a next state-of-the-art model, as it is called, to achieve superior performance in different tasks, like in this case, let's say image classification. Similarly, uh, there came a time when uh, researchers started to invent models which were more efficient and which could work on mobile devices and on the edge. So that is where we ended up with architectures like MobileNet V1, V2, V3 and so on, which basically focus on different types of methodologies where it uses residual connections, but also it tries to use aspects like depth-wise separable convolutions, which can enable it to perform similar operations but with less computation and hence it can be used in let's say low power devices or low compute devices on the edge instead of sending everything back to the server which is what happens with on the edge computing and one of the recent models is the efficient net family and we briefly touch upon this because uh so i will be covering this when he, when he talks about how we can attack a pre-trained model and how does it perform on adversarial attacks. So if you read up about transfer learning, one of the most recent family of pre-trained models is efficient net, which focuses on a concept called compound scaling, where it tries to scale three different aspects of neural networks. One is the width, the depth, and the resolution. So it tries to focus on all of these and it tries to build a better network, which is more efficient from a computation perspective, but has seemingly outperformed other models on most benchmark data sets uh, recently. 
And again, this is not the, let's say, best or most groundbreaking model out there. A lot of other models have come out uh, by now, uh, just like big transfer from Google and so on. So feel free to explore some of these models if you're really interested in transfer learning. For the purpose of today's session, we will be showing you how you can use some of these pre-trained models do some image classification and how some of these models can be fooled even if they are like really powerful models and then how can you tackle that so that 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 will be one of the main aspects of our session now in terms of training a neural network so so far i've just said about this back propagation and so on i just want to talk about the typical flow so you can visualize this before we head into more of the hands-on and more deeper concepts so a neural network usually consists of multiple layers. Each layer will have a lot of hidden units or neurons. And what happens is your data and let's say your labels are present. You pass your data through all the layers of the network where features are extracted, some computations are performed. That's known as a forward pass. And then what happens is your predictions, you compare it against your actual labels. And then you try to find out what is the loss. And the loss depends on the nature of the problem you're solving. Like, let's say if you're solving a classification problem, it can be a cross entropy loss. If you're solving a regression problem, it can be a squared error loss. And then what happens is you perform differential calculus on this loss with respect to each and every layer, starting from the end of the network. And then using those gradients, because as you know, if you take a differential of your loss, you end up with gradients. And then what happens is you use those gradients to update the weights of each and every layer of the network. And that is basically the whole process of backpropagation, which is continuously repeated till you end up with a model which where the loss doesn't go down further. And then you know that that is the time to stop training the model. Because uh, getting a perfect minima where let's say your loss is zero, that, that's like impossible. Or if that's happening, uh, usually you end up with an overfitted model. So you have to be careful with those aspects. But coming back to the point, the whole point of a neural network is to perform parameter updates to minimize the loss. And that's your training objective. And the typical flow involves that you have your input, which is basically a bunch of features or could be an image, could be audio, video, whatever. It goes through multiple transformations across a wide variety of layers in your neural network. And then what happens is once you pass the input through all these layers, you end up with some kind of a prediction from your model, depending on whether it's a regression, classification, whatever. And then you have your true labels, you have your predictions, you use your loss function to compute the loss. And then you backpropagate the gradients to update the layer weights. So each and every layer of the neural network, you will be updating the weights via your optimizer. And hence, this process repeats time and time again till your loss no longer decreases. And thanks to TensorFlow or PyTorch, nowadays you have easy automatic differentiation. So you don't need to sit and write each and every uh, calculus equation to uh, backpropagate the gradients. And uh, if any of you are interested in deep learning, this is a book which is definitely recommended by the creator of Keras himself, Francois Cholet. So the second edition is also out. He has even open sourced his code on GitHub. So for those of you really serious about deep learning, this is definitely a recommended book. Now we will be covering this piece of code here because you will see this come in time and again in our hands-on examples. This is known as a custom training loop in TensorFlow. Now, we just discussed about this back propagation aspect, right, where we are computing these gradients from the loss and then we are trying to update the layer weights, let's say. So how do we do this in code? So that is where we have this kind of a structure where it uses this construct called a gradient tape. Now, a gradient tape records all the relevant neural network operations, typically in the forward pass. And it records all of this on what's literally called like a virtual tape so that you can easily compute the gradients in reverse order during the backward pass. Because remember, during back propagation, the updates will happen from uh, at the end till the beginning. So each of these layers will get updated in reverse uh, with the gradients. So that is where you can easily compute the gradients without doing it manually by just using gradient tape here. And it is very useful to extract the gradients based on the loss which you are getting so that you can actually fool the system using adversarial attacks. So that is where we will be using this construct a lot because uh, imagine you are getting some loss here and somehow you modify this in some way after you get the gradients 
in that way you can basically try to fool the network in saying that even if it's making a true prediction which is actually correct you modify this gradient in some way to make the model think that no it's making a wrong prediction so that is the whole essence of this back propagation operation where we will be using this gradient tape as you can see and a standard workflow is you usually train a model for a certain number of iterations or epochs and in this case what happens is we will have multiple epochs and for every epoch we will go through some input features and their corresponding labels and when we compute the logits from which we get the final loss because the loss is basically going to be based on your loss function what we can do is we can get the gradients easily by just calling tape.gradient of the loss and then all the trainable weights of the model so this enables us to get the gradients of each and every trainable variable of each and every layer and then what happens is we can use this and apply the gradients on all our layers from back till the front and this enables us to do the back propagation process so whatever you saw here this visual depiction is basically represented here in the form of code so hopefully this gives you an idea about deep learning in a short amount of time given that we have limited time for this workshop in case you don't understand everything don't worry too much about it you can always go back and read about this especially if you just read about back propagation and the whole process of training a neural network you will get that for now all you need to know is you have some input data you have some labels you pass it through the neural network you get some predictions you try to see how close is it is to the true labels and that gives you your loss from which you try to extract some gradient so that you can tell all the layers of the network that adjust yourself so that you can get closer to predicting the true labels. That's the whole point of a neural network. So now I will uh, hand the stage over to Saek so he can discuss about the wide variety of uh, adversarial attacks. And then we'll head into some of the hands-on sessions also. Over to you, Saek. I'll stop sharing. Yeah, yeah. Give me a second. Yeah. Go cool. ahead, you can start sharing. Yeah, good, good. From yes. I assume my screen is visible. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, so hello once again. Uh, so I'm Sayak and I'm going to be speaking for the next 10 to 15 minutes about uh, different kinds of adversarial attacks. Basically, I'll be introducing them uh, later in the workshop. You will be also exposed to uh, some of these adversarial attacks that we will discuss in terms of uh, TensorFlow code. So stay tuned. So the first adversarial, uh, so the first type of adversarial uh, at, uh, example that I would like to cover is a natural one. These are also known as natural uh, adversarial examples. And the premise here is if you pass these kind of images uh, to a model that's been trained on ImageNet, chances are that you will not be able to get uh, a good prediction and hence these are these are labeled as uh, natural adversarial examples because these examples are naturally very hard to classify and and any any state of the art model can you know typically fail to infer correctly on these kind of uh, images so this this snap that we are seeing here is taken from the paper called natural adversarial examples and uh, here's uh, here's a quote directly extracted from uh, from the natural adversarial examples paper. It reads: DenseNet 121 uh, obtains around two percent accuracy, an accuracy drop of approximately ninety percent. So the authors of this paper called natural adversarial examples they constructed uh, constructed a data set consisting of only uh only images that are that are proved to be uh, you know naturally adversarial and then they took uh, an image classification network that's been trained on the popular image image net data set and in this case uh, which was which was uh, which was a dense net uh, one to one and by that time it was already a state of the art network and they applied that pre-trained model on the you know on the natural adversarial uh, data set and and the net and the pre-trained network was able to obtain an accuracy of only two percent a direct you know expected accuracy drop of uh 90 so this is how vicious 
can natural adversarial examples be uh, if they are not you know handled properly and now i would like to discuss a few reasons that that the authors also mentioned in their paper uh, as to why why this uh, you know state of the art image classification networks fail to infer correctly on this natural adversarial example so the first uh, reason is when we are training an image classification model using convolutional neural networks often times an entire image is mapped to a single class and in this particular image we can see a dragonfly but besides the dragonfly we can also see some kind of a carpet carpet like pattern right and if if our models are not being given instructions as to how to discriminate or how to distinguish uh, in between these objects properly and all all our models are exposed to a single discrete level chances are that the model models can get confused uh, when they you know when they see examples like this which have you know more than one objects of interest uh, inside inside the images so the fact that uh, when training models on image uh, ima on the imagenet data set uh, each image uh, is being mapped to a single discrete class this fact makes uh, you know makes the learning process sometimes very confusing uh, for a model and hence they uh, they can fail very poorly on natural adversarial examples like this and the second reason is uh, you know using colors and textures as opposed to uh, using shapes as the primary feature descriptors uh, so the premise premise here is we as humans we are more prone uh, toward you know using shape uh, in order to you know uh, classify a particular image uh, and so on but uh, it, but all the you know research evidence uh, show us that all the state of the art uh, image classification networks tend to focus more on color and textures as opposed to shape in order to you know describe a particular image which is also one of the reasons as to why the state of the art networks fail to you know infer um fairly well on this natural adversarial examples and in case if you were wondering whether or not adversarial training might help uh when dealing with natural adversarial examples well i guess by now it's clear robust adversarial training methods hardly help as mentioned by the authors uh, of the natural adversarial examples paper so how can we you know deal with natural uh, adversarial examples in the first place then uh, so i i haven't purposefully included uh, the solutions but if you are interested they propose mainly two recipes in order to mitigate uh, this problem first is the use of self attention uh, inside cnns uh, self attention is a mecha mechanism that helps us to you know model long range dependencies in a very systematic manner and also mo uh, a deeper network tends to you know help reduce the confusion that we just discussed that they are not able to you know distinguish between different objects present inside an image uh, and so on and also using stylization as one of the augmentation techniques during training an image classification model also helps so these are you know few recipes that we can use uh, when training our image classification models in order to mitigate problems like this but this is an highly this is a highly active area of research so uh, we never know when these methods uh, would fail so yeah so now i would like to you know uh, change gears and uh, uh, shift to synthetic adversarial examples which are also known as adversarial attacks so the entire point here is to you know purposefully add perturbations or noise uh, in the input data of the model in order to fool the model uh, intentionally and these uh, these these adversarial examples are generally synthetically created as mentioned using some kind of perturbation perturbation vector and also one very important po point here is after adding that small you know perturbation vector to the input data the input data should you know appear to be very similar to the human eyes so that's that that's a very careful thing to note when constructing uh, synthetic adversarial examples and 
as mentioned in the slide also these notorious perturbations are indistingu indistinguishable to the human eye but it can cause a network to drastically fail as you can see on the figure uh, on the left side the, the 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 natural image is of a panda but when we you know add a very small amount of perturbation to it the image is getting predicted as a gibbon uh, by a state of that image classification network so that's the kind of challenge uh, you get with you know synthetically created adversarial examples okay so the impact of adversarial ex uh, uh, synthetically generated adversarial examples can be you know quite brutal uh, so uh, consider this case where uh, you know where the task is to predict whether or not a given uh, image uh, is is denoting benign cancer or, or malignant cancer and if you are adding perturbations in order to fool this you know classification model and the predictions can be very harmful so the impact of synthetically created adversarial attacks can be you know uh, very grave so here are some main principles uh, to create adversarial attacks in a synthetic manner so here are some questions so generally as dipanjan discussed uh, we take we take the gradients of the loss with respect to the trainable parameters of the model being trained so what if instead of you know uh, taking the gradients with respect to the model parameters what if we had calculated the gradients with respect to the input data so so the next question that i would like to ask here is what if we had you know updated the input data uh, with these gradients in order to maximize the loss generally when training image classification networks we generally you know minimize a uh, certain loss quantity but what if uh, we update our input data in order to maximize the loss instead of minimizing it and also in case if you are wondering why we are so so much concerned about the gradients well that's because gradients inform us uh, about how much to nudge the input data to affect uh, the loss function in this case right because it, or more generally gradients inform us uh, how 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 a particular quantity depends on the other and how much does it depend to what extent uh, it depends on the other quantity right so gradients are very useful pieces of information here uh, so there are many adversarial attack techniques uh, such as uh, you know projected gradient descent uh, targeted attacks and also fast gradient sign methods and all of this will be covered in the session and let me and let's start with the projected gradient descent uh, attack first uh, so here we you know as i as i was mentioning earlier we generally you know perturb the input image by adding a very small amount of you know noise or perturbation vector to the original input image and the general principles that we just discussed will remain the same in case of projected gradient descent so we you know start by start with the objective uh, of perturbing the input image with certain delta now we'll be you know referring to the small perturbation vector as delta to maximize the network loss and we initially you know initialize uh, this delta uh, vector uh, to be all zeros and no random initialization is done uh, in order to you know relax the optimization problem and the uh, objective here is to create an image uh, across iterations that maximize uh, a given objective or or maximize a certain loss and after each optimization step the delta is projected back to a normal we, in this case we use the l infinite norm and we achieve that by clipping the delta vector uh, to a certain quantity so that it does not change the visual semantics of our uh, original model you wouldn't want to you know uh, add add a perturbation vector to an input image such that the original semantics of that uh, input image uh, are getting changed so we wouldn't want that in order to you know enforce that constant we you know clip our delta to a given range and um, so that our semantics you know stay as original as possible and the goal here is to you know 
uh, fool an already trained model and this kind of attacks are also known as white box attacks because we do have access to the original model which we would like to fool right and if the model or the model or the model parameters were not available to us in that case those kind of kinds of attacks would be referred to as black box attacks as, uh, as well and similarly there there's also a notion of targeted projected gradient descent uh, attacks uh, sorry i mean I, I i probably skipped ahead a bit but uh, let's continue uh, you know with with the projected gradient descent attack itself so here the loss for predicting the two true class goes way up uh, in so uh, instead of minimizing the loss for predicting the true class we maximize it as we had discussed earlier and this form of gradient descent based uh, optimization is also referred to as projected gradient descent because we are you know projecting our uh, you know learned parameters to a certain normal and hence uh, this is also known as projected gradient descent and uh, delta is random but it's learned as we will see in the notebooks right and there's also uh, this notion of uh, you know targeted adversarial attack and the you know core underlying principles uh, stay uh, very same uh, so we you know similarly initialize our delta vector to all zeros no random initializations and the objective here is to you know create an image across iterations that maximizes the loss for the true class and at the same time minimizes the loss for the target class so uh, in layman's uh, terms we would want our network to predict the image of a hog to be as an image of a dog so that's how you should interpret a targeted adversarial attack and as you can see the objective here is to maximize the loss for the true class which is hog in our case and to minimize uh, the loss for the targeted class which is dog in our case and similarly like the vanilla projected gradient descent attack you know the delta is projected back to a normal by clipping uh, its values to a certain range and the goal here is to fool an already trained model uh, which is also a form of white box attacks and of course the loss for predicting the true class let's say hog will go up here and the loss for predicting the target class which is dog here will go down and as i mentioned this is also uh, this is a form of what we call targeted attacks and i guess uh, there's one more point before we jump uh, right next to the notebook demos uh, this is this is the concept of adversarial defense with noisy student training. So we'll be dealing, uh, you know, we'll be discussing a bunch of uh, adversarial learning techniques. But uh, we also wanted to give you an idea of what it what it's like to you know obtain a commandable defense performance uh, against adversarial perturbations, but uh, with networks and training methods that do not even incorporate any explicit adversarial training objectives so in the adversarial you know adversarial training or adversarial robustness literature you will see a lot of adversarial you know training mechanisms which help us to you know create robust models but there's also this literature that that explores training you know robust models in a broader sense that can generalize to adversarial perturbations as well and noisy student training is one such method and as you can see it does not incorporate any explicit adversarial training objective and on the left hand side on the left figure we can see uh, an efficient net model trained with noisy student training is able to you know retain its its robustness uh, up to a very fair extent when compared to an efficient net model trained using you know vanilla methods and the authors of the noisy student training technique attribute this success to you know recipes like very strong augmentation techniques uh, usage of stochastic depth uh, and random dropouts so uh, while training noisy student training uh, while using noisy student training they used augmentation policies from rand augment but uh, it's okay if you do not know about it but i just wanted to also mention the recipes uh, that are you know that are behind the success of noisy student training and i guess uh, this is the end of my talk for this particular interval now i'll hand it off to dipanjan and he will walk you through uh, some notebooks which will hopefully make the concepts clearer
Th thanks a lot, uh, Sayak. I think that was a good uh, introduction to the different types of attacks. So I will just uh, reshare my screen. Uh, now, I just want to say here, or just to recap, like what we are trying to explain here is that uh, we will look at two types of attacks to start with. One it was the projected gradient descent, as uh, Sayak mentioned, and the second one is the targeted attack, if you remember. So the whole point of the projected gradient descent is we will pass, uh, we will already have a pre-trained model because if you are attacking when you are training a model, that doesn't make sense, right? Think of it from, let's say, a hacker's perspective. There will already be a model which has already been trained and is in production and is, it is running. And you as a hacker, you're trying to hack into that model to try and disrupt it, make it predict something completely wrong. So that is what we will be doing. We will be taking, let's say, an already trained model and we will be trying to pass an input image and then based on the loss which is being generated uh, once we pass the image to that model we will try to get the gradient from that loss and then we will try to uh, modify whatever is being fed as the input to the network so that uh, it gets fooled into thinking that the loss is going up and then it feels that even if I'm making a correct prediction, it's probably wrong. And then it ends up making a vastly wrong prediction. So this noise, which we will be adding in the form of the Delta, as it's mentioned, it is learned. So it's not like we are just guessing some noise and passing it. We are actually computing this noise from the gradients of the loss. And then we are superimposing it back on the image. And we keep doing this till it ends up making a vastly wrong prediction. And that is what you will be seeing in the hands-on example shortly. And then we'll go into the targeted attack. So this is the first uh, notebook which we will be covering. And by the way, as mentioned, all of this is there in the GitHub. So don't worry about uh, under, like trying to capture everything or something. It, 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 it's all already there. So focus on the main uh, flow of what we are trying to do here. So what we will be doing here is we will be loading up some basic uh, utilities from TensorFlow, including some uh, functions to pre-process images and one main model which we will be using like I said we will be using an already pre-trained model as I mentioned most of the pre-trained models uh, in convolution neural networks are trained on the ImageNet data set and if you google ImageNet you will see the data set is also available it's a huge data set with millions of images and the base ImageNet data set uh, usually consists of a thousand classes and these classes can be anything like uh, animals, vehicles, th things like that. So the whole point is we will take a model like ResNet 50, if you remember, we had shown the architecture earlier. We will take this model, which has already been pre-trained on millions of images and has achieved really great accuracy on the benchmark. And we will try to fool this model by passing it an image of that hog, which you saw earlier. And we, we will try to make it predict it completely wrongly. So that is where we download the image of the pig and we download the ImageNet label mappings because we need to know in the output layer, you will usually have a thousand neurons because uh, you are trying to predict one out of the thousand classes. That is my problem, trying to predict one out of the thousand classes. Now, I need to know based on when this model was trained, let's say on the uh, ImageNet data set that which neuron belongs to which class because I can't just say that get me the loss of the pig class it as you know any model doesn't understand text or strings it everything it understands are numbers so we need to know which position in the network amounts to the loss for the pig class so that is where we need this mapping file which is available open source uh, as you can see so you can get the ImageNet class mappings from anywhere on the internet so that is one of the dependencies which we download and we download the sample pig image which you already saw in the slides so that we'll pass this hog or this pig and we'll try to fool the model so now we have some basic utilities and you can go through these later also but all we are trying to do is uh, this is basically loading up an image and showing it using matplotlib uh, this is a basic uh, pre-processing function for pre-processing the image so that we can just resize it to uh, 224 cross 224 pixels that's your height and the width if you think about it and uh, this is basically helping us to uh, clip the values uh, as you can see clip the epsilon values between 0 to 1 
So these are just some basic utilities which we use when we will be trying to perform the attack on our model. Now let's focus on the most interesting part. So this is what our image looks like, the pig image which we downloaded from the web. This is what it looks like. And what we do is we load up the pre-trained ResNet model. And as you remember, I mentioned earlier, and Saik also mentioned that most of these pre-trained models are trained on the ImageNet data set. So we say weights equal to ImageNet just to tell it that load up the pre-trained weights which you learned when you were trained on the ImageNet data set. So this is a fully functional uh, image classification model which we have just loaded. Okay, this is already a pre-trained model. We are not going to train it, but we are trying to fool this already trained model which performs really well in image classification. So now if you see that we load up this pre-trained model which is available in this variable called ResNet50 and all we do is we say ResNet50.predict and we pass in this uh, image of the hog, right? The pre-processed image of the hog. And then we decode the predictions and you can see that uh, the top prediction is a hog with a 99.9% .9 probability. So as you can see, this model performs really well. It has been trained on millions of images out of which several hundreds or thousands of images were obviously of different animals. So this is a model which is not, uh, I mean, it's a pretty good model. It's not some trivial model. And as you can see, the top one prediction is hog, second uh, prediction is wild boar, and then piggy bank. And you can see the probabilities are also really, really low here. So obviously the top prediction is a hog, which makes sense. And the image net mapping for this is 341, which means in the output neuron of thousand classes, the neuron number 341 will fire, and then it will end up predicting that, okay, this is indeed a hog. So that's what is happening behind the scenes. Now the idea is if this model is giving such a great prediction, can we fool the model into predicting something completely else where the image will look very similar as you saw in this uh, presentation, but it will actually end up predicting something completely different. So the idea will be to superimpose this noise and make that noise or learn that noise also. But before we do that, just to show you about the loss aspect. so. The loss function which is being used here is called a sparse categorical cross entropy loss. Uh, categorical cross entropy is a popular loss function to figure out how far you are from the true labels because you're dealing with classes. And if you see that the loss is basically pretty low, because obviously if the loss is very low, that means it is predicting with a high amount of confidence that this is a hog. So basically it is very confident in its prediction. Now the whole point for us to do the projected gradient descent based attack is to uh, somehow ending up uh, making the model fool into increasing this loss, which we will be supplying through the gradients, which we will compute from the loss. And that's why it's known as a projected gradient descent based attack. So what should happen is the loss for predicting the true class hog, which we will repeatedly pass through the network, instead of staying constant at this number, it should start going up. Okay, so that is what should happen when we try to do this. And now we will write a utility function for this where we initialize the loss function. We initialize the optimizer because you obviously need an optimizer to optimize your model to update the weights based on a learning rate, uh, the based on the gradients and the learning rate to optimize the original weights. And as you remember, we use a gradient tape function here. So we will run it for 50 iterations here. And all we are saying is uh, the delta, which is a learnable parameter, we are saying to keep a track of this delta variable. Remember, delta is basically this thing which we are trying to learn. Okay, so all we are saying it is that uh, pre-process the input image and superimpose the delta on it. So essentially what's happening is we are basically trying to get the gradients of the loss every time in this iteration and we are trying to superimpose that with the original image and that is what is happening here that every time it goes into this loop it will pre-process the input image along with the gradients it will predict based on this image which has already been superimposed with this gradients it will compute the loss based on the model prediction it will print the loss so you can actually see that the loss will go up and then before the next iteration kicks in for the model, it will compute the gradient of this loss. And then what it will do is it will apply these uh, gradients uh, with basically whatever is changing now. 
and then this becomes our delta so our delta is basically something which is being learned in every iteration and this delta which is basically this learned noise based on the gradients which it is obtaining from the loss it is being superimposed on the image every time so after 50 iterations the hope is that since we are introducing this learned noise on top of the image the image will still look very similar to the original image so to the human eye it will look exactly the same but to the model it will look very different and it will end up predicting something completely wrong so that is what we do now we take in our input image which will be the image of the hog we pre-process it in this function uh, and this function helps us in performing the projected gradient descent attack so before performing the attack we just do a model dot predict on the pre-processed hog image and we show you the top three predictions and then what we do is we initialize the delta we perform the attack here basically and then we show you the prediction after the attack is performed okay so this is what this function is doing here and then what we do is we do the perturbation on this pig image with our pre-trained model which we are trying to attack on and you can see that the prediction before performing the attack obviously the same what you saw earlier predicting a hog with 99 percent probability and then you can see that for every fifth iteration here we are printing the loss and if you see here ignoring the sign you can see that the loss is slowly going up as you are um, iterating through the 50 iterations and the reason is obviously because we are superimposing that gradient as the delta on top of our image and then predicting again and again and computing the loss again and again so obviously the loss keeps going up and this is how our delta looks like which the model has learned from the gradients and now if you superimpose this with the original image, this is how your image looks like. If you see visually, it looks exactly the same. To the human eye, it's indistinguishable. But the model is getting affected by these gradients now. And you can see that it has ended up predicting the class as wombat, which is a completely different animal. And if you search on Google, you can see that this is a wombat which is obviously not a hog though it looks kind of similar but you get the point so this is where the model has ended up completely misclassifying the hog and you can see the second most probable prediction earlier was a wild boar but now it's predicting it as a bucket so basically our attack was successful where the model predicts with a high confidence a completely different animal so that is the whole point of this projected gradient descent attack where the key focus was to compute the loss compute the gradients of the loss and continuously update the image and make it fool into thinking that you are making a vastly wrong prediction even though it was correct and then this ends up in the model suffering vastly and making a completely wrong prediction so that is the whole point of uh, uh, this is the whole point of adversarial uh, projected gradient descent attack now we will talk about the same thing in the context of uh, the targeted attack where instead of it predicting a random class wrongly we will try to force it to be fooled into thinking that this is let's say a dog and that is the whole point of this targeted attack where everything remains the same but we will modify our overall loss now where the loss for predicting the true class should still go up that will still happen now the loss for the true class obviously has to go up but the loss for the class which we want to fool the model into thinking that okay this is the correct class that should go down and if you remember this is easy to extract because the last layer of your neural network will have those thousand neurons and you can extract the loss which the model uh, generates for any of the classes so obviously when the model will predict the loss for the hog the default model if you remember the loss was 0.004 so it will be very low so that we will extract we will also extract the loss for this class of a dog and this loss will be slightly higher because obviously the model is predicting with a high confidence that it is not a dog it is a hog but we will try to fool the model into thinking that the loss for the predicted class which we want it to predict will go down so that is your targeted attack where we will fool the model into thinking that the loss for the correct class is going up and we will also fool the model consequently to thinking that the loss for predicting a wrong class which we wanted to predict will go down and this can be dangerous because you can uh, hack into a model and try to fool it into predicting the class which you want it to show and that can be very dangerous 
And that's exactly what we will be doing in this uh, next uh, notebook here, uh, which is the targeted projected gradient descent. So everything remains the same. All the dependencies and everything are same. We use the ResNet 50, we get the pig image. Everything remains the same. This is for showing the image. This is for resizing and pre-processing the image. This is for clipping the delta values to stay between zero to one. And if you remember, this is our uh, image of the hog and we load our pre-trained ResNet model here. And then if you predict, obviously, the top class is hog because we haven't done any attacks yet. So now we will do the attack. We generate our optimizer, we generate our loss function. And now when we compute the loss, you can see that we are getting the loss related to the true index, which is the image of the hog. And to it, we are also adding in the loss of the target index, which is the index of the position of the class which we wanted to predict, like a dog. So essentially, we modify a loss function using this additional component here. And everything else remains the same. You compute the gradients and you update the gradients with the base image. And then you basically perform this attack inside this function. So this function is exactly the same as before. We load up the image, we pre-process it, we do the prediction before doing the attack, and then we initialize the delta parameter. We learn this vector or we learn this uh, delta tensor by doing the projected gradient descent attack, and then we superimpose that noise on top of the image, and then we make the prediction again. So this function remains exactly the same. Everything is the same. The only change is we have added the component of the loss for the class which we want to make the model fooled into predicting and then when we run this initially this is our image and our model before the attack predicts it as a hog and now you can see here that uh, the loss overall is starting to decrease uh, because we are trying to fool the model into thinking that this is actually that of a dog and how we are doing this is Index number 341 is, or position number 341 in the ImageNet model is that of a hog, and position number 189, if you check the mappings, will be that of a dog. So you can take the same notebook, and you can, if you want to predict it as a ship, let's say, there will be a position of ship in that model, and you can just pass that index here and try to fool it into predicting it as a ship. So now what happens is, position number 189 is that of a dog, so we're trying to decrease the loss overall to fool the model into predicting this as the most probable class. And once this is done, this is the noise and we add it back to the image. And if you see our prediction is a Lakeland Terrier, which is a type of a dog. So this is basically a Lakeland Terrier, as you can see, and this is a, obviously a dog, not a hog. So the whole point here is we were able to fool the model successfully into predicting it as the desired class which we wanted it to predict. So you can see that the second most probable class is Wombat, which it had shown you previously as the random class it had selected, uh, which was the wrong class. And in this case, we forced the model into predicting it into the wrong class which we wanted. And this is a more dangerous type of attack, which uh, can cause a lot of issues, given that these kind of models are employed in mission critical systems. So now this covers the aspect of targeted projected gradient descent. So hopefully this uh, makes sense into uh, the two types of attacks and distinguishing between the two types of attacks where one is about uh, modifying the loss in such a way and modifying based on these gradients and superimposing that in such a way that it ends up predicting a wrong class. And the second one is you are trying to target that learning in such a way that it ends up predicting a wrong class, but it ends up predicting a specific class which you want the model to predict. So that is around the targeted gradient uh, descent, projected gradient descent attack. So now uh, Sayak will show you that how some of the pre-trained models which have been trained using some of these robust techniques like noisy student training and so on, how they can somehow still be effective against these kind of attacks. So he will be talking about this next using some hands-on code. And then we will go into the last type of attack before diving into how do you train your model to prevent all of this from happening. O over to you, Sai. Yeah, I'll just share my screen and get started. Uh, I hope my screen is visible and yeah, let's get started. 
So for the next couple of minutes, I'll be walking you through uh, the same uh, category of attacks that Dipanjan uh, just introduced you, but in a broader sort of setting. So Dipanjan showed us how we can easily fool uh, a state of the art network like ResNet 50 with vanilla projected gradient descent attack and also targeted attacks. We'll be you know, using those same kinds of attacks, but we'll be trying to attack uh, different variants of efficient net that Dipanjan had talked about uh, earlier uh, uh, in the talk. So yeah, let's get started. And again, all of, all of the materials are already available and Dipanjan will chat the link again uh, in the chat so that you can uh, refer to it if that's needed. Uh, so during during my half of the talk, I briefly mentioned about you know noisy student training, which is uh, which is a training technique uh, that does not you know involve any explicit adversarial training objectives, but it can still produce fairly robust uh, deep representations of images that are you know that can stay robust even under adversarial perturbations, right? So yeah, let's actually verify that. Uh, in terms of code, so you know much of this note, much of the contents of this notebook uh, will be very similar to the ones that Dipanjan already uh, walked us through. So here we are, you know, doing a bunch of imports, and then we are, you know, gathering a sample, the same poor how image, and then we are also retrieving the ImageNet class ID mappings, and from here on we will be you know we'll be demonstrating some things that are very specific uh, for for you know launching this uh, projected gradient descent based attacks and as dipanjan had already mentioned the eps is what we use in order to clip the delta vectors so that the semantics of the original image you know stays exactly the same uh, it stays in the you know it stays in the acceptable bounds and here we also you know define a bunch of utility functions that we'll be using uh, throughout the notebook and now we start off uh, by downloading the pre-trained weights that were that were generated using this technique called noisy student training and here in this particular notebook we are using the efficient net b0 variant there are there are a bunch of different variants when it comes to efficient net each you know each comes with a different you know compound scaling factors and different amounts uh, of different you know configuration settings and stuff so you would you would want to you know uh, put put some attention here uh, b0 is the smallest uh, efficient net variant so we are starting off by downloading the pre-trained weights and also this is important to know that Noisy student training wasn't just trained using the ImageNet data set. There were also other sources of unlabeled data. Those data sources were not completely labeled. So it's also important to know that noisy student training does not only incorporate uh, ImageNet, but also a very large corpus of unlabeled data uh, as well. And then then we are of course extracting the third uh, pre-trained weights and then we are using an already you know uh, already provided script to convert those pre-trained weights into a format that is acceptable by the keras models because keras is the framework that we are going to use and we are going to use it from tensorflow itself and h5 is a typical typically known you know keras uh, weights format and which is what we are doing with this uh, script we are first converting the pre-trained weights of the noisy student training to uh, to the keras weights format and then uh, you know we are uh, loading we are loading the pre-trained weights of the efficient net b0 the vanilla weights basically the weights that were that were gathered using training uh, training and efficient net b0 on the image net data set only and at the same time we are also loading uh, the pre-trained weights that were gathered using noisy student training inside the same you know application class called efficient net b0 be because as i mentioned there are different variants of efficient net training right because there there's this technique called concov there's this technique called adv prop and noisy student training is the most updated one so yeah
and there's also something called meta pseudo leveling but yeah don't worry about it if you haven't heard about it yet so after that we are incorporating our vanilla uh, you know efficient net b0 to make some predictions on on our on our hogs image and as you can see it's able to predict that this image is of a hog with almost you know 95 percent confidence and then let's see what happens if we use the same efficient net b0 but in this case which is initialized with the noisy student training weights and in this case as well it's able to predict that this image is of a hog uh, 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 around with you know 95 uh, percent confidence so we keep all the you know attack generation uh, utilities to be exactly same as you can see we are initializing the same adam optimizer we are initializing the same sparse categorical cross entropy loss and all the all the settings of you know attack generation are basically the same so our objective here is to under is to verify under the same hyperparameter configurations whether or not we are able to fool different variants of efficient net uh, or not okay let's see and as i mentioned repeatedly all the utilities for generating this attacks and superimposing those perturbation vectors on our original input image they are all the same so yeah let's see so first we'll be you know taking the vanilla efficient net b0 and we will see if we are able to fool it uh, using the vanilla projected gradient descent method and as we can see the 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 training cycle starts with of course the correct levels which is hog the confidence is about 95 percent and as we see as we you know progress as we make progress uh, through the uh, training process we can see the lo loss you know we, we can see the loss landscape and we can also see the kind of random but learned uh, delta uh, delta vector which is our perturbation vector and after you know superimposing uh, this random but learned delta perturbation vector on our original input image the, the semantics of the original input image uh, you know do not change it's still visually similar to our eyes right but let's see let's see the prediction after we pa pass this you know synthetically generated uh, image to the vanilla efficient net b0 variant so as we can see the predictions uh, have now changed to angora with a you know couple 96 uh, with 26 percent con uh, confidence and which sub which which supposed to have changed the original predictions right originally we had hog with you know 95 percent confidence but now we have an angora with about 26.5 percent confidence also the second prediction has also got changed which in this case is hamster but still it's not warm but right before we saw that when we were trying to fool the resnet 50 model we were able to you know make the change the predictions to warm but but in this case we are uh, we are still not there yet right and now let's see what happens if we apply the same thing on a on an efficient net b0 but in this case this is initialized with the noisy student training weights now let's see as usual it starts with the original predictions of hog with about 95 percent confidence and after generating after launching the you know adversarial attack the predictions are still the same right it's still predicting hog although the confidence has you know decreased quite significantly but still it is predicting the you know art, uh, the artificially generated image to be as a hog which is which is promising so the entire point of verifying of whether or not under same hyperparameter configurations uh, if we are able to you know fool different efficient net variants it turns out that it's actually harder to fool the efficient net variants and in this case if you initialize uh, an efficient net model with with the noisy student training weights chances are that with those hyperparameter configurations you might not able to you know fool that network in the first place so this is quite promising and exciting and it holds a lot of practical significance right now you might not need to you know worry about training uh training net networks using you know 
very comprehensive adversarial learning mechanisms chances are that you can get away in certain cases just by using pre-trained noisy student training weights inside efficient net variance right now let's see what happens if we if we did the same thing but for targeted attacks only let me switch to the other notebook and let me load it up real quick it's loading so i'll let it load yeah it's loaded so in in this notebook we are going to keep everything everything to be exactly the same but only we'll be launching a targeted attack instead of a vanilla projected gradient descent bit, uh, based attack so as you can see we start with our you know usual imports we gather all our you know important files uh, we then you know download the noisy student training uh, noisy student trained weights of the efficient net b0 variant we convert it to the you know uh, keras weight uh, weight format we then load these weights into the efficient net b0 keras application class and then we launch our targeted attacks and as i had mentioned before all the attack generation utilities are going to stay exactly the same so let's see so similarly we are trying to you know fool our efficient net variants of networks by believing that this hog is actually a dog and you can see 341 is the you know integer id for the hog inside the imagenet uh, data set and 189 is the integer id for a lakeland terrier which is a kind of a dog so let's see as you can see the training starts with the correct predictions with about 95 percent confidence and after launching the targeted attack let's see what happens and our initial goal was to you know fool the network into believing that this is this is a lakeland terrier but under the same hyperparameter configurations and training schedules we are we are unable to you know make our network uh, believe so it, it it still believes that it's it's a picture of a wombat but with you know point point zero five uh, with only five percent confidence which is again uh, which is again an evidence that tells us that it is probably you know way harder to you know fool or launch uh, projected gradient descent based attacks on different variants of efficient net and let's see what happens if we try to do the same thing uh, on a noisy student trained no, noisy student training initialized efficient net b0 again we are we are trying to fool our network into believing that this is an image of a dog not a hug our poor hug sorry and as you can see it starts with the correct predictions and after launching the targeted attack let's see what happens it still believes that it is a hug right even though even though the confidence is way way less but it still believes that uh, it's an image of a hog and not a dog even we you know explicitly tried uh, tried tried it to believe so right so this again suggests that under same hyperparameter configurations uh, it's way harder to fool different variants of efficient net right and now before we proceed to you know the other variant uh, uh, to the other type of uh, adversarial attack i would like to also walk you through the process of fooling a fooling a custom image classification model that's trained using transfer learning so let me load up a notebook and get started yeah you can show that for a while because uh, that is important so far we are showing you on imagenet data but now let's say you are having someone who has built a custom model how do you uh, try to fool that so that's what uh, so will be showing yeah. and the, the, as dipanjan mentioned that this is probably uh, more practically relevant because uh, in most of the industrial use cases imagine trained models might not be directly applicable you would want to use them to initialize your base networks and make use of transfer learning in order to train uh, custom models on custom data set use cases so that's the purpose of showing this notebooks right uh, in this model uh, so in this notebook will be uh, fine team fine tuning a pre-trained mobile net v2 model so we are you know shifting away from our uh, classic resnet 50 
uh, regime and instead we are using a mobile net b2 uh, network uh, as as the base which will be fine tuning later in this notebook and the data set of choice for this notebook will be the flowers data set which contains five different categories five different categories of flowers and as you can see this is how our data set looks like there are uh, you know merely 3000 or 3 3, 3 3500 images categorized into five different classes like roses tulips sunflowers and so on so this is how our data set looks like and we st of course start by importing a bunch of uh, you know uh, utilities and then uh, we use the tensorflow data sets uh, library in order to load our data set and it also gives us the you know training and validation splits pretty nicely and here we define all our class levels in an alphabetic manner and then we visualize a montage of uh, a montage of a montage constructed uh, on a batch of images taken from the training data set and then we uh, start by you know writing a utility class a utility function for pre-processing the images and we keep all the dimension uh, keep the dimensions of all the images to two to four comma two to four because this is one of the expected time uh, this is one of the dimensions expected by the mobile net v2 model and here we construct our tensorflow data sets and then we also define uh, methods in order to you know construct our custom classifier utilizing the pre-trained weights of our uh, of our mobile net v2 network used as a feature extractor and we also you know write write a utility method in order to plot the training progress of our custom uh, custom classifier so here we start by loading up the image net train weights of the mobile net v2 model and we exclude uh, the top part that is the classification part because we'll be using uh, this model as a feature extractor and we'll be fine-tuning its weights uh, to adjust to our flower classification task as well right okay and also we have a lot of evidences that suggest that if we use if we use a learning rate schedule to be very specific if we decrease the learning rate as we are making progress inside the training toward the very end of the training as the network you know learns so much more about your data it usually helps so a learning rate schedule where you know the learning rate is decayed with progressive with progressing epochs that schedule is you know believed to be uh, very effective in order to you know stabilize the stabilize the neural network training and then we also define an early stopping callback in order to prevent the model from overfit overfitting to our training data set and then we kick start the training process and as we can see after 10 epochs the model is able to you know yield uh, a training accuracy of about 98 percent and a validation accuracy of 90 percent okay and then we take that you know trained cluster custom image classification model and you know uh, use use it to infer on a few uh, validation samples and we also plot those samples along with their ground truth labels and the predictions we got uh, from our uh, custom image classification model that we just trained and as we can see for most of the parts it's it's pretty accurate as you can see for this particular image the ground truth is daisy and our custom image classification model is able to predict it uh, daisy with 98 uh, percent confidence which is pretty great and you can you can see that overall overall the model is able to you know uh, predict correctly with very high confidence values okay and now we'll use all the same you know attack generation techniques that we we, that we have been studying for a while now uh, throughout th throughout the course of this workshop and we will use those methods in order to apply apply them on our uh, on our custom image classification model so all of the code that that's been that, that that's been included here they have been discussed before so don't uh, don't worry about it and particularly we'll be trying to fool our custom image classification model by launching a targeted projected gradient descent based attack and let's see what happens so we'll be 
will be trying to fool our network into believing that the image of a dandelion is actually an image of a tulip and in as you can see the index of of a dandelion of a dandelion class is zero and the index of a tulip class is four so accordingly we'll you know call our utility methods and let's see and as you would expect the network starts with the correct predictions it's dandelion and then as we you know make progress in the training as we can see the loss you know uh the the loss keeps on getting uh increased and then after you know launching the targeted adversarial attack as we can see we are able to fool our you know custom image classification network into believing that hey this is not an image of a dandelion this is actually an image of a tulips so we are able to you know apply the similar you know attack principles on on a custom image classification model as well it's not like uh, they only apply to pre-trained models. They apply, they apply to any you know stochastic gradient descent based uh, model. I mean, they apply to a model that's been trained using stochastic gradient descent. So those fundamental concepts you know apply to different domains as long as you are training models in a certain way, which in this case uh, is using uh, stochastic gradient descent. So that's there. Now that we have sort of established that these attacks are really worrisome and they can generalize to different uh, classification use cases i would like to also you know demonstrate the efficacy of efficient net so earlier we saw that it's it's quite hard to you know fool different variants of efficient nets under certain hyperparameter configurations so let's see whether or not that similar principle or that similar recipe holds to our custom image classification use case. So let's see. I'll let it load. And yeah. So basically, we'll try to fine tune uh, an efficient net model that's being that's been initialized with the weights of noisy student training and then we will see whether or not it's uh, whether or not we are able to actually launch launch a targeted attack on our custom image classification model which is based on an efficient net variant again with initialized with noisy student training weights so as usual we start with our regular imports we load up our you know flowers data set which looks something like this we then prepare our data set and then we write our uh, utility functions in order to you know create the custom classification model uh, we then download the noisy student training efficient at b0 uh, pre-trained weights and we, we then convert it to a format that is acceptable by the keras application class yeah we we then load up the noisy, tra noisy student training weights into the efficient net b0 application class and as you can see we are trying to we are not trying we are using the same hyperparameter configurations here which includes our learning rate schedule as well the same learning rate schedule the same early stopping callback and as you can see for for about after about 10 epochs of training the network is able to you know yield an accuracy of 96 percent and a validation accuracy of 93 percent so which which suggests that we are already making progress in the earlier mobile net v2 case it was it was giving us a validation accuracy of 90 percent but in this case we have a three percent validation accuracy boost which is quite great and then we are you know using the same efficient net b0 model but we are initializing it with the image net weights and as we can see after 10 epochs of training it's it's giving us a validation accuracy of 91 percent which which still is better than our mobile net v2 uh, based custom classification model right and then we use both of these models to you know perform perform some demo predictions and as as we can see in mo in all of the cases it's able to you know predict um predict correctly with pretty high values of uh, pretty high confidence values right and it applies to noisy student student trained model as well right now our purpose is to you know verify 
whether or not we are able to you know launch a targeted attack on these models right on these different efficient net b0 variants uh, one that is trained using the image one that is initialized with the image net weights and one that is initialized with the noisy student training weights right and let's see and our you know objective is still the same we are trying to fool our network into believing that a dandelion's image is actually an image of a tulip and the index of a dandelion in case you you forgot was four and the index of a tulip uh, was zero so yeah let's see and as we can see the training starts with the correct uh, predictions and as we can see the lost landscape is it's it's kind of rigorous it's it's decreasing but i mean decreasing in a negative manner it's not very it's not as rigorous uh, as the one that we saw in case of the mobile net v2 based network right and let's see and even after you know completing the training with the similar hyperparameter configuration we are not able to you know fool our network into believing that this image is of a daisy right maybe a longer training schedule could have helped maybe different hyperparameter configurations could have helped but our purpose is to establish that under you know similar hyperparameter settings it's quite harder to fool different variants of efficient net model right and for noisy student training initialized uh, network it's still you know giving us a prediction of daisy even after being attacked so we are not able to launch a successful targeted attack here which which you know resonates the fact that efficient net variants have something magical going inside them their architectural choices better informed uh, inductive priors and recipes like you know stochastic depth and uh, stronger data augmentation policies they really help even if you do not train these networks with an explicit adversarial objective so uh, that's it for my half and i'll now hand it off to dipanjan and he will be introducing fast gradient sign method which is again another type uh, of adversarial attacks so over to you dipanjan yeah th thanks a lot uh, i will just share my screen <laughs> can you just uh, unshare oh, so i can yeah so this is the uh, last type of attack which we will be covering we we'll look at an example and then we will go into the last component of this session which is on adversarial learning so the fast gradient sign method is uh, very similar to the type of attacks which you have seen so far the idea is it will still use the gradients uh, from the neural network to create an adversarial example and the key objective here again is to create an image ultimately that will end up maximizing the loss in the network so that it can fool the model obviously and the gradients of the loss are uh, taken with respect to the input image which is being passed and then based on the loss but the main thing to remember is that the new aspect here is which you can see even in this equation here is that the sign of the gradients is taken and then you multiply a small multiplier to it like let's say 0 0.08 or something like that and after multiplying a small coefficient to the sign of the gradients not the actual gradients but the sign of that uh, you try to fool the model so this is basically like an example where you have an image it's predicting sorry about that so it's predicting, as you can see here, uh, the sneaker with a probability of 100%. Now the idea here is that after we do the fast gradient sign method uh, here, then it ends up predicting it as an ankle boot, which is not the correct class. So the whole um, thing here, how it's different from the previous attacks is, most of it is similar, but what we do is we use a multiplier or a coefficient, we multiply it by the sign of the gradients, and then we superimpose that. And in that way, this is known as a fast gradient sign method because we are superimposing the sign of the gradients on top of the image and then we are trying to fool the model. Now we will head into the 
uh, hands-on aspect of it to show you how this happens and then we'll start talking about uh, adversarial learning so this is the notebook for fast gradient sign method we will what we'll do here is uh, we will try to do a simple image classification problem here and then we will try to fool the network so this is a data set which is very common uh, it's called as the fashion MNIST data set. So there are 10 different types of uh, clothing uh, apparel here. And the idea is to train a model using all these images so that it can be able to predict. If you give an input image of a uh, uh, clothing it, uh, apparel, it will be able to predict the class of it. And as you can see, the input uh, data set is around 60,000 examples of training and 10,000 is your test data set and every input image of clothing is of size 28 cross 28 and they belong to 10 classes so overall these are some of the sample images as you can see so what we will do is we will build a convolution neural network and we will train it from scratch on the fashion MNIST data set we will compare the performance of how does this model how, how well it can distinguish 10 different types of clothing from the images we will look at the accuracy then we will perform some attacks on this data and then we will see how does it affect the accuracy of the model. So uh, TensorFlow already has this data set available. You just need to call load data and it will load the training and the test data sets for you. And as you can see, there are a total of 10 labels uh, here of 10 different types of clothing. So basically what that means is all the input images which you see here, they will either be a t-shirt or a trouser, a shirt, sneaker, bag ankle boot and so on now what we will do is we will just train a convolution neural network if you remember that's the model which we have been talking about so far so we will train a model on this data set so that it can start predicting the classes of this clothing based on images and we will try to compare the performance of this so right now we are not doing any attacks all we are trying to do is to see the performance so that is where we just do some basic normalization of the images and we just display some of the images. Like this is how an ankle boot looks like. This is how a t-shirt slash top looks like, uh, dress, sandal, and so on. Now the idea is to train the model using these images and these labels. So this is how your regular convolution uh, neural network looks like. You have an input layer which tells us that I will be passing images of size 28 cross 28 so images of size 28 cross 28 will be passed one is for channel since we are passing a grayscale image if it was color then it would be rgb now this is our input layer which tells the model that i will be getting images of size 28 cross 28 and then if you remember we use a stacked convolution pooling architecture where we use two layer cnn which has first a layer of convolution where it uses 32 filters to extract 32 different feature maps and then it downsamples them using pooling similarly it does the same thing again and then downsamples using pooling then it does a flatten and then a dense layer is like a artificial neural network dense layer so it's a fully connected layer and the final layer as you can see it's not thousand anymore like ImageNet, but it has only 10 because we are predicting 10 classes. So the last output layer, the number of neurons will be 10 because it will be one of uh, these 10 classes, if you remember. And then we create our model. This is how the model summary looks like. So input images of size 28 cross 28 and output will be 10 neurons. One of them will get activated based on the probability of the most likely class. And then we just have some utilities to plot the model training. And then what we do is we initialize the optimizer, which is going to be helpful to optimize the weights of the model. And this is a loss function, if you remember, because we are doing classification. And then we compile and train our model. Okay, so after we generate the data sets here for training and test, we say that we will pass 64 images at a time for uh, like one batch will be 64 images at a time will be passed into the model. And then we will just train our model. And you can see that over time, the training loss starts uh, decreasing and uh, the accuracy starts increasing and similarly the validation loss also starts decreasing and uh, the validation accuracy slowly starts increasing and after a while it just stagnates so overall these are some of the learning curves but the more important thing is that okay we have trained a model on this custom data set so it, we have trained it on 60,000 images so how does it perform on 
the 10,000 unseen images. And that is what we do here, where we take our model, we predict it on the test data. And you can see that overall our accuracy is 90%, which is pretty good. We are able to predict most of the classes uh, out of the 10,000 images pretty well. And that is where you can see that uh, most of the t-shirt stops we have predicted correctly here. This is like the confusion matrix. If you know machine learning, you'll know about this. In case you don't know, the idea here is to compare based on the actual labels and my predicted labels, how many are correct. So here, like I am predicting uh, 96 uh, t-shirts as shirt, which makes sense because a shirt and a t-shirt look very similar. So that is what we are trying to see that the more the numbers on the diagonal, the better the model because it is making very accurate predictions. So overall, this model has a 90% accuracy on the test data set. And so far we haven't done any attacks. So now we will focus on the fast gradient sign method attack. So the whole point here is have your images, but use a coefficient multiplier, a delta multiplier, and multiply it by the sign of the gradients of the image, superimpose it on the image, and then try to fool the model. That will be what we will do. So we have the original image, which is x. We will compute the gradient of that. And then we will take the sign of the gradients. We will multiply it by a small coefficient and we will add this value, which is going to be this noise on, back onto the image. And that is how we do the fast gradient sign attack. So we have created some helper functions here. This function is just to get the model predictions, which you get like the top one prediction or top two predictions, like we had shown in the previous examples. Now this is going to help you to the fast gradient sign method. So as I mentioned to you, our focus is the input image. We get the prediction from the input image, which is basically the prediction which the model makes. We compute the loss based on the true label and our predicted label. This is nothing new to you. You have seen this before also in all the other attacks. Now, once we get the loss, we compute the gradient of this loss. This is also something which you have seen before. The new thing for you here is this. So here, using TensorFlow, we get the sign of the gradients. And we return the signed matrix, okay? The sign of the gradients. We don't return the actual gradients. And then what we do is to perform the attack, the function is very similar. We get our input image. We get the model prediction before doing the attack, as you can see here. Then we get the sign of the gradients using this function here. And then using a small multiplier, by default, we take it as 0 0.01, but we can change it. So we just multiply that coefficient with the sign of the gradients, which we get from this function here. So we are multiplying this by epsilon and superimposing it back on the image. And this forms our fast gradient sign method attack. And then we basically again predict it after performing this perturbation. And then we show you the results. So essentially, this line here, which you see, is the code version of this equation. OK, sign of the gradients multiplied by the epsilon superimpose on the image. And that is exactly what you see here is happening. And now you can see it on some examples. Like before doing the attack, the model was predicting this is actually a quote, and it was predicting it as a quote with an 85% probability. Now, after superimposing this noise on this image, it is predicting it as a pullover with 98% probability, which is obviously not true, though they are kind of similar. The next one, as you can see, it predicts a sneaker as an ankle boot. This is the example you saw in the slide deck, where originally it was a sneaker. Model is also predicting as a sneaker. But now after the attack, it is predicting as an ankle boot, which is wrong. Uh, the third one is it's a dress. And the model is predicting it as a dress also with a 89% probability. After doing the attack, now you can see the image remains the same. But the model is now predicting it as a trouser, which is completely wrong. So this is an, ex an extreme case where the model makes a really wrong prediction. These are still kind of similar classes, but this is a completely wrong thing because this is actually a dress. And then another one is uh, sandal. As you can see, the probability is very high here. So even after doing the attack, you can see it still predicts it as a sandal because the classes as compared to sandal are very different. And you can see the probability drops slightly. So maybe if you used a higher multiplier, maybe it would have changed. So it's not like this attacks will always be successful. It will depend on the nature of the classes also. So all we do now is we take this uh, 
code which we have done and we just put it into a function so that if you remember we tested our model earlier this 90 percent accuracy which we got we tested it on 10,000 samples of the test data now what we'll do is we will attack each of these 10,000 samples of the test data and pass that perturbed data set with the attacks to our model and see how will the performance be now as compared to 90 percent before so that is where we have our utility functions here where we get each image from our test data we will generate the sign of the gradients we will multiply it by the epsilon we'll add it back to the image and we will add it to a list of attacked or perturbed images and you can see we run this function for our test data of 10,000 samples so now we have 10,000 perturbed test images after doing attacks on each of those images and now all we will do is we will pass these images to our model to predict and you can see that on this attack based data set it's only 40 percent now so the accuracy has dropped by 50 percent so this kind of shows you the implication of uh, these kind of models where if you have a really good performing model with a 90 percent accuracy it can end up performing really badly if you introduce just a slight amount of noise in each example and you can see that uh, a lot of the examples are predicted correctly in many cases but a lot of examples are being misclassified also as you can see in a lot of cases so that basically tells us that uh, these things are something which you have to be really careful about and this is where adversarial learning comes into perspective which we will look at next that can we somehow condition the model to learn this kind of noise or these kind of attacks also so that in the future if it faces that it can tackle that and that is the focus which we will have in the next part of a session which will be the last part of a session so now we will be talking about ad adversarial learning which is all about trying to focus on uh, being able to uh, prevent these kind of attacks by training the model or making the model learn these kind of adversarial examples and that is known as adversarial knowledge and this is where we will be uh, looking at uh, adversarial learning where we will try to impart this kind of knowledge of these uh, adversarial examples uh, back into the model by training it on them and these are some of the major points of uh, adversarial learning that it is still a very new topic it is an active research topic this is not like something which has existed decades back and is very mature it is still evolving the idea is very simple you have your organic data which is data without any noise or without any such attack based examples but you will also generate some of these noise based data or noise based examples by doing the perturbations and by doing the attacks and then you will train your model on both these variants and the other option is also to use adversarial regularization loss and we will cover this uh, shortly in the last part of the session which covers neural structured learning which is a uh, another interesting framework from uh, uh, google and tensorflow folks and then again these are good methods but may not always be enough for natural adversarial examples and that's where things like noisy student training smooth adversarial training these are some aspects which can help uh, tackle some of these issues now let's talk about uh, how we can apply adversarial learning on our data set so you have already seen the standard fashion MNIST data set that has 60,000 training examples of uh, data which doesn't have any noise or perturbations in it so we will train our CNN model on the organic data set and you have seen that already we have shown that to you uh, that it uh, learned pretty well and it performed like got 90 percent accuracy on the test data so first we will train it on the data with no issues and then we evaluate the performance on the test data set which was 90 percent and now what we do is we apply the attacks to create a perturbed version of the training data set okay and we also apply the attacks on the test data set we evaluate the performance of our simple cnn on the test data set so this part and this part the ones in purple this is something you have already seen in the previous notebook where we just built a model without any adversarial learning we did the fast gradient sign perturbation on the test data and we tested the performance and you saw that from 90 percent performance here it dropped to 40 percent so this is something you just saw the new thing which we will do now is we will apply this adversarial learning concept by taking our training data doing the attacks on that also to generate some noisy 
samples or noisy images and train the model on the noisy version of the data as well as the clean data. And then once we do that by training our model on the organic train, which is the clean train data and the attack based train data, then we will try to test the performance on the test data set, which we will try to do the original test data set also to see how does it perform on the clean test data set. And we will also perform attacks on the test data set and see how it will perform. So the whole difference now is that we will train it on a perturbed version of our training data set also besides just the clean images. And this is the overall flow. So uh, don't get confused by the lot of arrows here. So what is happening is we have some training data here. And this training data is coming from our original 60,000 images uh, for training. And the 10,000 images uh, here is basically our test data. So initially, we just do a basic training without any adversarial learning. And we check the performance on the test data, which was 90%, if you remember. Then what we did was we applied the perturbation attacks on the test data set. And we compared the performance of the model on the perturbed test data, which was 40%. The new thing which we will do now is we will take this training data. We will perform attacks on this also. And we will use the attack based perturb perturbed images as our additional training data and train a new model. This is the part which will be shown now. And then we will test the performance of the model on the perturbed test data as well as the original test data. So we will do both. So this is going to be our focus now before we head into the last part of this session on neural structured learning. So this notebook will cover everything which we just talked about. So the data set is exactly the same. Nothing changes. We are trying to train a model to predict the 10 types of clothing apparel. So we load our data set. And as you can see, 60,000 images of training images and 10,000 test images. Right now, we are just scaling our data, some basic normalization, and then we are building our convolution neural network. Right now, we are not doing any adversarial attacks or learning. So we are taking the input images, passing it through two layers of convolution and pooling. And then the last layer is going to be your 10 neurons to predict one of the 10 classes. So this is exactly what you saw before. Nothing has changed previously from uh, what you saw in the previous notebook. And then we train our model with the 64 images in every batch. And uh, you remember this, right? We had around 89% validation accuracy. So this is exactly the same as the previous notebook. And then you remember that on the actual test data, without any attacks, the performance was 90%. So this is all familiar to you. You have already seen this before. Now we perform the attacks on the test data. This is something you had already seen. So we have some utility functions here. We have a function here to do the attack, right? Because this is the function which will get the gradient from the loss and then get the sign of the gradients. And it will return the signed gradients back. And we will multiply it by an epsilon parameter, as you can see here. So we get the sign of the gradients uh, using this function. We multiply it by an epsilon and put it back on the image. So this is something you have seen before also. And then we basically. Uh, these are the examples you saw before, so I'm skipping this. But if you remember, we generated a perturbed version of our test data set. So 10,000 images, we took each image one at a time. We computed the sign of the gradients. We multiplied the uh, coefficient of the epsilon with the sign and added it back to the image. We did this 10,000 times for the 10,000 images. And then we tested the performance. And you remember it was 40%. So, so far, we have covered whatever you just saw in the previous notebook. Now, the idea is can we improve the performance of this? And that is where what we do to enable that is we take our training images, which are 60,000, and we perform attacks on these images also. We try to generate variations of images or clothing with that kind of noise built in. And then we create a combined data set of our actual training data set without any attack based examples and our adversarial train data set, which will have the images with those perturbations based on the fast gradient sign method attack. And then we train a model on this. And you can see the overall performance is very similar, um, almost 88 to 89%. Now what we do is we take this model, which is the adversarial trained model, and we check the performance on the regular test data set. So here, no attacks have been performed. And you can see that the performance is 89%. So it has dropped by around 1%, let's say, from 
the previous model, which got a 90% accuracy, if you remember, on the clean test data set of 10,000 samples. But now if we take the perturbed examples of test data, like the 10,000 images with the noise, you can see now the performance is around 97%. So earlier it was 40%. So this kind of shows you that if you condition your model to learn uh, images with some kind of variation and noise, which it can probably see if these kind of attacks are being performed, it will be able to handle that quite well. And that is the whole point of this adversarial learning where you are training the model and conditioning it to understand examples which are regular as well as attack based so that it can handle those kind of attacks in the future. So this kind of covers the essentials of uh, adversarial learning from scratch. Now you will see a new framework called neural structured learning and I will hand it over to Sayak to cover this before we uh, wrap up our session. Over to you Sayak. Yeah, thanks. I'll just share my screen and get started. Okay. Yeah. Welcome back, folks. So now uh, we'll be uh, shifting gears uh, to to an entirely new framework uh, that's uh, developed and maintained by uh, the TensorFlow and Google folks. It's called Neural Structured Learning. It's a framework for uh, training models using you know adversarial adversarial training objectives as well as concepts borrowed from uh, graph uh, graphical machine learning so yeah let's get started so the so there are some objectives that one needs to uh, keep in mind when working with neural structured learning uh, neural structured learning leverages you know structured signals in addition to our original input data and this the this in, the structures uh, can be implicit or they can be explicitly represented uh, by means of a graph right and implicit structure uh, can be you know incorporated during the training process by leveraging ne nearest neighbors uh, that are similar to a given uh, given input sample and adversarial examples as we saw they can also uh, be considered as you know nearest neighbors because visually an adversarial variant of a particular image these are visually indistinguishable right so they can also be considered uh, as you know structured signal and also nearest neighbors uh, right and structured signals are you know typically used in order to represent relationships or you know basically similarity relationships among samples because that and that can act as that can act as an informed inductive prior that can help uh, a model to learn about you know different implicit similarities that might be present uh, within its training within its training samples right and also models that are trained with adversarially perturbed uh, training samples they have they, they have shown uh, they have shown robustness uh, towards you know malicious uh, malicious uh, attacks uh, so stru structured signals can be generated you know by sampling samples uh, in a graphical manner or they can be adversarial examples, as I mentioned, because adversarial examples can also be considered uh, as examples that are very similar uh, to the original uh, inputs, right? And the objective uh, insight that you will see uh, for struct neural structured learning is to you know minimize a loss that comprises of two terms. One is the classical supervised loss, which can be binary cross entropy or categorical cross entropy, along with the neighbor loss. And neighbor loss depends on how you know you are representing uh, the you know structured signals because structured signals can be sampled uh, in a graphical man manner or, and or they can be sampled uh, by adversarially perturbing your in original input samples right and we would want to minimize the supervised uh, loss for getting accurate predictions and at the same time 
uh, we would want to minimize the nearest neighbor loss in order to you know maintain the similarity consistency among among the inputs that are coming from the same feature uh, feature space right and basically we start when dealing when we're working with neural structured learning for adversarial training uh, we start by you know creating uh implicitly uh, implicitly structured signals uh, by by you know generating adversarial examples and then we use these adversarial examples in order to regularize our model in an adversarial way so our total loss becomes uh, a combination of this classic supervised loss which can be uh, a binary cross entropy or a categorical cross entropy loss along with the adversarial loss so in the previous slide we saw our total loss must comprise of two terms one is the supervised loss and one is the neighbor loss and the neighbor loss in this case which is adversarial learning in this case that will be adversarial loss so so we will end up minimizing the supervised loss for getting accurate predictions and also minimize uh, the adversarial loss in order to you know maintain similarity uh, among the inputs and their adversarial variants right and using uh, neural structured learning framework with our good friend keras is extremely simple as you can see in this construct here in this code snippet we are first uh, loading the classic MNIST data set we are then scaling the pixel values to a range of 0 comma 1 then we are you know defining our model using the sequential api and then we are asking our model to train using uh, adversarial regularization uh, regularization and we are also you know specifying a bunch of uh, hyper parameters which we will discuss when we get to the notebooks but after you know instructing our model to train using adversarial regularization rest of the process is exactly the same we compile our model we fit our model and then we uh, evaluate our model if needs be uh, so this is sort of the uh, blueprint of you know uh, training models using neural structured learning with an explicit adversarial uh, training objective and also before we proceed uh, to the neural structured learning notebooks here are some observations that we uh, you know gathered uh, when training models uh, using adversarial learning so adversarial training methods that uh, that are dependent on a specific perturbation technique which in, the, in this case uh, is fast gradient sign methods because fgsm is what we used uh, when we trained an adversarially you know regularized model from scratch and neural structured learning also uh, under the hood uses uh, fgsm uh, perturbation technique in order to generate the adversarial examples so these training methods depend on a particular perturbation generation technique right and these techniques do not generally generalize well to the other kinds of perturbations right because we saw that there can be other types of attacks or generation techniques right such as the pro uh, projected gradient based attacks right and it's also important to retrain with the perturb perturbed training set along with the original tra training set in order to prevent the model from catastrophic forgetting you would want your model to be robust to uh, adversarial perturbations and at the same time you would want your model to you know generalize well uh, to the original training set right and also from our observations we saw that smoother activation functions tend to work well when uh, you know when adversarially training uh, models if you are training it from scratch and this observation is coming from the paper called smooth adversarial training that came up in 2020 so you can see this is fairly modern stuff so when when you are training using smoother you know alternatives to ReLU, you generally get you know better informed gradients which help you to create harder adversarial examples and which in turn helps you to you know improve the adversarial training the training is if you are training with hardness the chances are that you will deliver as hard uh, as you had trained right so th that is the basic assumption here so you prepare yourself for a byzantine kind of fault tolerance right so smoother activation functions can really help you to generate those harder uh, adversarial examples 
and now i would like to you know walk you through a couple of notebooks that show how to use the neural structured learning framework in a transfer learning sort of a setting so let me quickly share my screen and get started okay so yeah the objectives of this notebook are uh, fairly straightforward we'll be seeing how to use the neural structured learning framework inside a transfer learning kind of a setting so earlier we saw how to fine tune a mobile v2 based network and we also saw how to fool that network by using you know projected gradient descent based uh, targeted attacks uh, right so we will see how neural structured learning can you know come into this framework and help us uh, to train uh, train models that will be uh, adversarially more robust right and as usual we start by loading up our dependencies then we use the tensorflow datasets library in order to load our flowers dataset the dataset is still the same this is how it looks like and also we prepare our dataset like the way we had done earlier we define our uh, utility functions for you know defining a custom image classification model and also plotting our training progress here we are loading up the pre-trained weights uh, for mobile net v2 and we are also chopping off uh, the classification top because we'll be using this network as a mere feature extractor right? we are using the same training schedule and then we are training it and as we can see after 13 epochs the model is able to give me a validation accuracy of 90 percent which is not great when compared to the efficient net variance right as we saw and we are here we are plotting a couple of predictions along with the original validation samples and as we can see the model is able to predict fairly correctly with high confidence values and now we finally uh, get to the neural structure learning part right and in the presentation we you know saw that when training models using a neural structured learning the total loss comprises of two things one is the classic supervised loss and one is the neighbor loss which in this case will be the adversarial loss so we end up you know jointly optimizing the features from original and the adversarial examples for more uh, robust models so that's the idea here so we first start by installing the neural structured learning library and we then import it and neural structured learning you know expects your data to be present in a certain dictionary like format where your images should be present inside the image key of your dictionary and the corresponding labels should be you know present inside the label key of your dictionary and keras you know uh, keras keras models also do support uh, the consumption of uh, data set formatted in this manner right and then we create our data sets to allow uh, this kind of formatting and then we create our adversarial specification so basically adversarial adv under uh, so basically the multiplier hyperparameter uh, controls the weight of the adversarial loss inside the total loss that we just saw because the total loss is a combination of the classic supervised loss and the adversarial loss so multiplier hyperparameter determines how much weight you would like to give it to it right and uh, adv underscore step size uh, determines the magnitude of the uh, adversarial perturbation uh, how how intensively you would like to perturb uh, your input images in order to create the adversarial examples and adv underscore grad underscore norm this this tells uh, neural structured learning which norm to measure the magnitude of the adversarial perturbation right and in this case we are using the l infinite norm and available options uh, are l1 norm l2 norm and the l infinite norm and l infinite norm we saw uh, in the earlier phase of this workshop right so the that's for that's all for the hyperparameters and then we construct our custom image classification model using the base mobile net v2 network and then we ask our model to train using those hyperparameter configurations using adversarial regularization and then we you know start the training process and the log is a bit hard to read but i'll summarize that for you so after 10 epochs 
uh, the model takes uh, the model is able to generate uh, a validation accuracy of about 90 percent so which is kind of same right uh, in the original uh, custom image classification model we also got about 90 percent validation accuracy but the total training time in the original case it was around how much it was it was around 72 seconds right but in this case it's 213 seconds uh, so the training time has uh, gotten increased quite significantly but that but that does make sense right because the model has to also figure out how to best optimize its parameters i mean the training process it's kind of it's kind of figuring out how to best optimize the model's parameters so that it's adversarially robot so this there's some more work going on here and as a result the training time increases uh, but yeah the gains are quite dramatic right as we will see later in the notebook okay now we will you know take this adversarially trained model and evaluate how adversarially robust it is under you know some adversarial perturbations generated using the fast gradient sign method so the the code here what to what is it's not important it's it's all basically you know utility uh, methods that we have referred from the official tutorial code so i'll leave that to you in order to you know uh, read through it because it's fairly straightforward but the important bit here is the original custom image classification models accuracy is 30 percent when it's exposed uh, to uh, adversarially perturbed examples from the validation set whereas that model trained using adversarial learning it's able to you know maintain an accuracy of about 56 percent given the fact that those examples on which this model was evaluated on were adversarially adversarially perturbed right and this is a big blow right and this is already in the positive direction in order to handle adversarial perturbations right and as we uh, now now we would like to take a batch of adversarially port up samples and we would like to see out of out of out of those out of the samples uh, in that batch how many uh, these two different models are able to you know predict correctly that these models uh, you know that that, that this images uh, correspond to i mean the labels that this images correspond to right and as we can see in a batch of adversarially perturbed uh, examples the base model is able to only predict 11 examples correctly out of 32 examples and mind and mind you that these examples are adversarially perturbed whereas the model trained using adversarial regularization or adversarial learning is able to predict 17 out of 32 adversarially perturbed examples so this is already good progress and let's visualize another batch so in this case the base model is able to predict only 10 out of 32 whereas the adversarially regularized model is able to predict 17 out of 32 which which is pretty good and now we would like to again verify under similar hyperparameter configurations how does you know efficient net uh, play out right uh, because that would be a fun experiment and let's actually do that right now so let's see so we are interested uh, to what extent a vanilla efficient net or a noisy student trained efficient net is able to maintain its robustness for adversarial uh, perturbations and also compared that uh, to an efficient net based model that's trained using neural structure learning the framework that we just saw right and let me switch to another notebook i let it load and yeah we have it so as as usual we are starting off by importing a few uh, dependencies then we are loading up the flowers data set using the tensorflow data sets library we are then preparing it for model consumption 
and then we are you know using the same utilities that we have already seen uh, during uh, during the workshop right and then we are downloading the pre-trained noisy student training weights for the efficient at b0 variant and then we are converting it to a weights format that is acceptable by the keras application class then we are constructing our custom image classification model the learning rate schedule is exactly the same and then we are kick starting our training and as we can see for for the for the noisy student training train based you know custom network after 10 epochs we are able to get a validation accuracy of about 91 uh, percent and here we also plot a few predictions and as we can see the model is able to predict fairly correctly and then we introduce neural structured learning we first start by installing neural structured learning and then importing it and then we prepare the data set in a format that is acceptable by the neural structured learning framework we keep this hyperparameters unchanged we do not touch this because our objective is to verify under the similar hyperparameter configurations if the efficient net variance would perform well enough right and let's see so i'll summarize uh, this law these logs for you so after six epochs the model is able to you know get me to 92 percent validation accuracy which is pretty great which is already surpassing the original model performance so it so it suggests that if if we trained using if we train our models using you know adversarial learning objective using a framework such as uh, neural structured learning it, it can also you know give give us some performance uh, boosts as well rather than just making the model adversarially robust it can also actually boost the original model performance right because it's learning to leverage the implicit structured signals which is important right and then we do the similar uh, adversarial evaluation we keep all the config hyperparameter configurations to be uh, similar to what we saw in the earlier notebook and as we can see the you know base model accuracy on the adversarially perturbed set is about 87 percent and the model trained using adversarial regularization it's only about 89 percent so we are able to see only a two percent increase whereas in the earlier case it was around 26 percent right so it's consistent with our you know expectations that different variants of efficient net they are kind of inherently adversarially robust because of the ways they are trained because of the recipes incorporated uh, while training them right and same 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 drill we are interested in taking a batch of adversarially part of samples and as we can see the base model is able to you know predict correctly 28 samples out of 32 whereas the adversarially trained model is able to predict 29 only one more right it's quite good in fact and in this case the base model matches the performance of the adversarially trained model right this is good progress and this is something that i would i personally would highly encourage you folks to you know uh, consider uh, consider using and you know dig deeper in case if you are interested in pursuing uh, this area of research right and with that i guess uh, i'm done with the neural structured learning stuff and now I'll hand it off to Dipanjan uh, to say the concluding notes. Off to you, Dipanjan. Yes, I can share my screen. Um, yeah, so overall, uh, this kind of brings an end to all the hands-on aspects which we just covered. So what you learned was uh, if you remember, just to do a brief recap, what you just learned uh, so far in the session was some essentials on deep learning in terms of uh, what is deep learning. You also understood deep learning in the context of computer vision, which basically talks all about how do you uh, 
uh, train models to recognize images and do some classification. And then we saw three types of attacks about the projected gradient descent targeted and also the fast gradient sign method. And also you saw how you can train a model so that it can be conditioned to handle these kind of attacks in the future so that it can prevent them. Now, obviously, none of these are completely foolproof. A lot of active research is ongoing, but the hope here is that things will continue getting better over time. And these are some things you should be careful about, especially if you are, let's say, going in as a data scientist or a machine learning engineer in a, a mission critical area like healthcare and so on, where, where you have to be careful. So these are some things just to keep in mind. In terms of the closing notes for the session, a uh, lot of this content is uh, available online. It's not like we have uh, created all this content from scratch. Of course, the examples and everything we have created, but uh, do check out these amazing frameworks like Neural Structured Learning, which is from TensorFlow. It's an open source framework, so any of you can use it anytime. And a lot of tutorials are available in Science repository itself. And there are a wide variety of articles as well as tutorials on TensorFlow. So do check these out when you get time. And in case any of you are interested to do, let's say, a uh, research uh, on this, some kind of research project on this, uh, you can go to this link here um, and you will be able to find the research papers which talk about the prior research which has happened. So maybe you can do something new or you can maybe extend these and do some kind of a nice project if you are interested in this area and uh, that kind of brings us to the end of uh, whatever we have covered so far hopefully this gives you some idea about deep learning computer vision deep learning for computer vision and adversarial learning uh, these are our social links since a lot of you have requested in the chat multiple times so feel free to reach out to us feel free to um connect with us uh, and you can follow our github also you will be able to get a lot of these uh insights in the form of code and resources which we post every now and then uh Sayak now nowadays posts at least more than me since uh, i am not getting a lot of time but hopefully i hope to do some more in the future so do check this out and feel free to reach out to us as necessary and yeah i am pretty much uh done Sayak. in case you want to add any concluding words feel free to do that yeah, so I guess you covered it uh, pretty much. So in case if you folks want to connect with us, feel free to you know connect connect with us over LinkedIn or you can check out our stuff on uh, GitHub. And if you have any questions regarding the content of this workshop, feel free to let us know. And also it would be great if you could give us a shout out as to how we did in terms of the content and presentation. That would mean a lot to us. So yeah, that's it. Thanks a lot, everyone. Yeah. Bye, folks. Uh, thank you for your time, sir. Uh, I guess this is the end of the session. So we'll be floating uh, the Google Forms for the attendance. A very big thank you to Mr. Dipanjan Zarkar and Mr. Saik Paul for the time that you gave us. And I guess this is. <laughs> From the reaction of the attendees, this is one of the best workshops yet. Uh, thank you, thank you very much for that. Sir. Thanks a lot for inviting us, and yeah, thanks a lot everyone for spending your uh, weekend with us. Uh, I know, like this is a pretty complex topic, but it's okay if you don't understand everything. You know the basics and the essentials. As you dive deeper into it, feel free to revisit it. All the resources are available for you. Thanks a lot. So the uh, Google form for the attendance has been posted in the chat section. Kindly fill it. Uh, so without that, we won't be able to distribute the certificates. Meanwhile, we have a video from our sponsors. Kindly watch that till the end.
those are the people they have spent their money on shades and that is why we are able to pull a online twist like this technology is revolutionizing the world as we know it Tata Projects is pioneering latest technology implementation in infrastructure. From project planning and scheduling through BIM to execution through state of the art equipment. We tap complex opportunities and enable the path of possibilities by simplifying and creating world class projects not our projects simplify create So yeah, thank you everyone for joining us. And regarding the Ashish query about the cancellation of third virtual tech summit, we'll be circulating the certificate on the basis of first two. Don't worry about that. And for the YouTube channel, please YouTube, uh, please search on YouTube by the name Shitej IT Khadakpur, and you will be finding all the content we have been uploading till date. For this part, we'll be uploading. all of the recorded videos within a month or two so you can regularly check the same to see it yeah also an update regarding the third summit it has not been cancelled actually it has been postponed to the second phase of the fest so it will be conducted on 29th and it will be conducted in association with unhcr you can find it it is a, a part of united nations uh they have the social initiative program it is a big organization which is present all over the world so they will be conducting a summit with us so it is going to be a bit grand that is why we decided to shift it to the second phase so be on a lookout for it we'll be announcing it very soon yeah we are working on some more industrial visit you you may be able to see it on the second phase of the fest I guess that's it from our side. Uh, please ensure that you fill the Google form without which we won't be able to distribute anything to everyone or uh, to anyone. Thanks a lot for having us, and we hopefully would like you to be present in the further sessions of the day. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you everyone. Have a nice day.